Kamigawa, a world trying to balance the traditions of the past with the marching thumb of innovation. Kamigawa Neon Dynasty sees this plane at a crossroads, honoring both the ancient spirits known as the Kami, while also expanding further into the future of technology. What place do the old ways of channeling the Kami, respecting balance, have on a Kamigawa where literal mech suits are a thing? This identity crisis seems to be echoed by one of Kamigawa's newest characters and our newest planeswalker in Magic the Gathering, one Kato Shizuki. Introduced in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, Kato is a stealthy Demir planeswalker who can create other ninjas. But what is this character's story? What is their role on Kamigawa and how did they become a planeswalker? That's what we're going to discuss today on the Ether Hub, the origins of Kato Shizuki and his journey through a world torn between the past and the future, all in search of a lost friend. Today I hope we can answer the question, who is Kato Shizuki and how did they become a planeswalker? When discussing this new planeswalker, it's a good idea to start with a little backstory to the world they're born into. The Kamigawa of Kato's time is one unlike anything we've seen in Magic the Gathering. Sure, technology in MTG has always been present, see the artificers of Kaladash for example, but Kamigawa Neon Dynasty is in a class all of its own. Electricity streaks through its heavily clustered cities, towering skyscrapers have replaced what used to be humble villages. On this world, texts such as hologram communicators, robotic drones, and mechanical armor are commonplace and available to anyone who could afford them. Life here has been made more streamlined. Luxuries and novelties are abundant. Yet still, it's an added complexity to a plane that carries with it so much history. Kato knows Kamigawa's past. The delicate balance mortals have with spiritual beings known as the Kami. Forces of nature, ancestors, powerful aspects of the world itself. In the 1,000 years since the end of the Kami War, the Kami have been slowly merging with the physical realm. The monks knew this and tried to make their journey through the metaphysical barrier easier with the construction of merging gates. No living mortal knows what lies beyond the veil, within the realm of the Kami, but something is drawing them through and their servants are more than willing to welcome them in. Still, as the barrier was originally restored to keep balance between the physical and spiritual realms, its fading leaves us with many troubling questions. It is in this world, the Neon Dynasty, that Kato was born to a noble family in the capital city of Inganjo. Inganjo is the seat of the Empire, a massive testament to the achievements of Kamigawa's denizens. It's now a hub of innovation, as well as a pillar of traditional values. Here at the seat of the Emperor, the Kyodai Temple, samurai warriors train in hand-to-hand -hand combat, willing to lay down their lives to protect the peace. Here, Kato and his sister were left at a young age to be trained in these grand halls in pursuit of greatness. Kato from a young age showed he had a quick temper. He had a flair for the pageantry of ritualized combat, as well as the natural stamina and dexterity it took to actually become a great samurai. These qualities were first noticed by his instructor, a kitsune, or fox folk, named Lightpaws. Lightpaws trained the children not only in martial skills, but also educated them on history, diplomacy, and the important role Kami play in the Empire. While Kato leaned heavily towards physical training, his younger sister, Aiko, was more interested in the Kami. In Nganjo, there are those known as Kami Diplomats, a relatively new profession given the relatively recent crossing of spirits into the physical realm. This esteemed position is given to those with kind souls and gentle demeanors, but with wills as strong as iron. It takes a very special person to commune with the Kami, especially if that Kami is naturally more… aggressive. Still, it's an important role in Kamigawa's society. They serve as a bridge between mortals and Kami, as a guide to the physical world for those of Ether, and help to balance relations when Kami and mortals just can't see eye to eye. 
and it was this role that Light Paul saw fit for Kato's sister. Here they trained day after day. In between, Kato explored the palace grounds and would eventually run into the Emperor herself. Quickly, the two formed a friendship, the Emperor having an unbelievable connection to the Kami, and the spiritual realm always intrigued a young Kato. The Emperor was connected to Kaodai, a mystical being, the fusing of spirit and flesh, sisters who blur the line between mortal and Kami. It was Kaodai who ended the original Kami War, Kaodai who maintained the balance between the realms. It was Kaodai who guided the Emperor on their journey for peace and understanding. But the relationship spanning Kato, the Emperor, and Kaodai would be shattered forever in a single fateful night. At the age of 16, Kato is training just as he always had, but as night fell, there was a strange energy throughout the castle that left the boy feeling unsettled. The night was darker than normal, Iganjo's lights flickering with unnatural energy. The Emperor typically stayed in Kaodai's temple, and fearing for his friend, Kato rushed to be with them just out of precaution. Though no one else seemed on edge, the young samurai in training feared for the worst. And the worst came to be. In a rocking flash that shook the foundations of the temple, tectonic quakes lowered the castle's defenses and awoke the troops. Though all rushed to protect the Emperor, Kato got there first and was the only one to witness the following events. In the temple where the Emperor should have been, there was only a lone figure, a man with a metal arm, who quickly escaped the scene. Kato charged after him, but the man moved with inhuman speed, a magic he could not place. And suddenly, he just vanished. When the smoke settled and things returned to normal, the Emperor was indeed missing, not leaving a single trace to their whereabouts. Despite having the best trackers and detectives at their disposal, the Emperor simply disappeared. That same night, another witness caught glance of something strange. This time, it was Kato's sister. From a brilliant flash of light, her vision adjusted, and she saw the shape of a kami. Traveling through the sky right above the temple during the attack, the light transformed into an animal, then vanished. She couldn't explain it, but as everyone else was distracted, she was the only one who could account for this strange event. While the investigation did continue on, the world of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty was not the same as it was. Importance wasn't placed solely upon the Emperor. Citizens still had their health, their items of convenience, and quickly the public moved on from their Emperor's disappearance. All save for Kato. For he didn't only lose an Emperor that night, he lost a dear friend. Though he knew he had to take matters into his own hands, as even his mentor, Lightpaws, simply didn't believe the boy when he told them about the man with the metal arm. None could believe a single human could break into Kaodai's temple and make off with the Emperor. It was unfathomable. Kato's account was discounted, and so too was his sister's. The world simply moved on. Believing he was the only one still searching for the Emperor, Kato left the palace grounds, abandoning his training and venturing to the seedy underbelly of Tawashi. Here in Tawashi, the people were laid back and complacent, happy in the state of their world. But just beneath the surface, stronger forces yearned for more. More power, more money. They are a gang known as the Hyozen Reckoners, a criminal organization that dates back over a thousand years on Kamigawa. These ruffians, these bounty hunters, are who Kato falls in with. Headed by the intimidating Satoru Yumazawa, the Hyozen Reckoners bring the youngster in as an underling. And while his training makes Kato an efficient tracker of marks, able to slip in undetected and steal back debt payments, some of his colleagues find his approach unbecoming of a reckoner. Kato is a true and honest samurai at heart. He just happens to be more skilled as a ninja. Still, joining the reckoners doesn't mean he turns on his ideals. Kato refuses to make people suffer needlessly. If he can get debts paid without bloodshed, then where's the harm? 
Besides, he only joined the Reckoners to pursue his own goals. This being, of course, finding the missing Emperor. The Hyozen Reckoners have access to the most intricate spy network on Kamigawa. If anyone had information on his friend, it would be them. Still, access to this information needed to be earned, and it could only be earned through Yumazawa's good graces. While extremely effective, his boss, like his co-workers, questioned his tactics. Thus, he called the young Kato in. Kato feared for his life. A mob boss like Sadaru would much rather make an example of someone than promote them. To his surprise, Sadaru, while questioning Kato's loyalty, still offered him the chance of a prestigious job. None of the other Reckoners knew about this mark yet, and it was a top priority target for the organization. Kato believes this is his chance to earn Yumazawa's loyalty. While Yumazawa knows Kato's skills as a tracker would be quite useful for this mission. It's a win-win. Kato accepts because, well, he can't really refuse, and he starts tracking his target, a Soratami, or Moonfolk, named Temishi. The job was simple enough, swap some schematics. Apparently, this Soratami had been working on some rather illegal devices that interacted with Kami, tech that attached itself and melded with the spiritual beings. This type of research was heavily frowned upon as it disrupted the balance between mortals and Kami. Essentially, it would control the Kami, which was against the natural order. Sadaru, of course, didn't care about that. These plans would be incredibly valuable in the black market, and it would net the Reckoners a pretty profit should they get to it first. With that, Kato traveled to Ottawara, the floating capital of the Moonfolk. A thousand years ago, the Soratami were guides for mortals to the spirit realm, great advisors to the lines of emperors. Though today, they stayed secluded and hoarded knowledge. They're the most intelligent and innovative race on Kamigawa. In fact, most of their grand achievements went on to make the Neon Dynasty we see today. Still, a group known as the Futurists were always pushing the bounds of research into dangerous territory, and Imperial forces would routinely be sent out to put an end to their discoveries. This Tamishi's Kamitech certainly would fall into that category. Sadly, Tamishi wasn't in Ottawara when Kato arrived, but the rogue did gather information of his whereabouts. It seems he had set up a research camp in the Jukai Forest in order to be closer to his test subjects. The Jukai Forest is a heavily spiritual place, a gateway between the physical and Kami realms. It's guarded over by the Jukai monks, an order of Kami channelers who protect the merge gates there, as well as their Kami allies. Certainly, if Tamishi's research didn't tip these monks off, he must be doing a good job at hiding. Still, for Kato to travel the forest, he would need a guide and a cover of his own. And he knew just the person. When he arrived, his sister had already received his message and was waiting for him in the Jukai Forest entrance. As a Kami diplomat in training, the monks would understand her purpose for entering the forest, and if any Kami came along, she could hopefully use her skills to defuse the situation, which came in handy rather quickly as they were approached by the Kodoma of the West Tree, a Kami of the woods who protected this sanctuary. With some nifty negotiating, they were permitted to enter. While Kato's sister was lenient on him leaving the palace grounds and his training behind, she wasn't about to suffer the indignity of offending the Kami. So while he was allowed to search, they would make special effort to keep the ground as tranquil as possible, which, of course, Kato quickly disregarded, pulling out his dagger when startled by a rock Kami. Regardless, they eventually found themselves at a waterfall, which Kato suspected their target was using as his camp using the loud roar of the falls to mask the sounds of his machinery and experiments. Again, his tracking prowess proved keen. There, Kato found the Moonfolk's base of operations, humming with futurist tech. He examines a cage containing a small creature. He believed it to be a Kami because of the nature of Temishi's research, but it was unlike anything he'd seen before. But then, he was interrupted by the target himself, the Soratami was a tall, slender man, young for his race, but one wearing a face of determination Kato had often spied on himself. The two squared off, 
Tamishi believing Kato was a Jukai monk who had come to end his research. Monk or thief, it made no difference. The scientist would defend his research to the death. Tamishi pulled out a small metallic object, and with a twitch of his wrist, it extended into a long metallic staff, an opposing weapon with sharpened edges. Kato pulled out his knife. Despite the physical differences, as Moonfolk are generally taller and more graceful, Kato rushed head-on, trading blows and offering speed to counter Tamishi's strength. The flurry of blows surprised the Moonfolk, and while dodging the dagger, he left himself open to a kick that landed square on his jaw. While Moonfolk have the ability to fly, almost levitate in a sense, Tamishi crashed to the ground from the blow. Using his enemy's polearm, Kato's eyes went red as he pressed it to Tamishi's throat. He would have ended up killing his target by accident if his sister didn't snag him from his rage. Tamishi was rather civil from this point, gathering what he could from the situation. First, he believed them to be Imperial units, who also frowned on his research. While that was true of his sister, Kato represented the Hyozen Reckoners and needed his notes. Though, through a random act, Tamishi realized that he and Kato had shared a mentor at one point. Another Moonfolk named Katsumasa. Katsumasa was a brilliant designer of mechanical creatures. He had taught Kato engineering at the palace and inspired Tamishi to explore robotics. This gave the two some commonality. The subject then turns to the matter of his research. Why would he try to control and bind the Kami to tech? Tamishi dismissed the idea, saying that his research was in fact to aid the Kami. With the physical and spiritual realms merging at an ever greater rate, one day, both will exist as one. Come that time, they would need to truly understand the Kami, for the benefit of all if they were to live with them fully. We use tech. Why shouldn't the Kami? And it could also aid in those less benevolent Kami. He noted that he conducted no experiments on any unwilling Kami, and that merging them with tech would always be a choice the Kami made. But sadly, as of now, he hasn't found a single willing participant. He hasn't actually tested these experiments. It seemed the wild spirits were uninterested in tech or having their freedom restricted. Should Akami merge with one of his creations, it would mean they were contained, and someone with the correct controls could in fact control Akami. Controlling Akami by force is something unheard of on Kamagawa, and that power in the wrong hands, like the Reckoner's hands, would prove disastrous. Everyone agreed on that point. Tamishi agreed he wouldn't continue the research, and Kato no longer wished to bring it to the Reckoners, with Tamishi saying he has committed most of the data to memory rather than writing it down. Sorotami are, again, really smart. The last thing that needed to be addressed was the locked Kami, that animal thing in the cage needed to be freed. But upon opening it, it clearly wasn't a Kami. Tamishi introduced him to the prototype for his Kami containment tech. It was a small, robotic tanuki. A spirit could inhabit this vessel and be controlled, monitored, or even kept safe if needed. Aiko stepped back in shock. This tanuki, it looked exactly like the kami she had seen appearing above the palace the night the emperor went missing. How could that be? The robot wasn't crafted until months later. Tamishi did admit that he had come to the Jukai forest chasing a particular kami the one who he had made this mech suit for. As the spirit appeared to be a tanuki, he made the vessel something similar to fit it. The moon folk believed this kami to be special, worthy of protection, because it seemed to have been born in the physical realm. To this day, all kami came from the merging portals. This one, however, was born in their realm. It had to have scientific importance. Just then, a sound traveled aimlessly through Kato's ears. No one else noticed it. It was the song of Kyodai, the great spirit of Nganjo, the guide of emperors. The Kami had never left the temple before. If she was here, maybe the emperor had returned. Kato chased after the song, but was puzzled when he only found a small, translucent Kami, curiously in the shape of a tanuki. This must be the Kami Tamishi was talking about the one his sister saw that fateful night. But, why did it call to him? Did it know something about the Emperor that it wanted him to know? Before he was given any answers, old friends had found him. The Hyozen Reckoners had arrived. The 
the burly thugs, accompanied by a woman who channeled the dark powers of the Kami of Betrayal, cornered the group at the campsite. Though the Reckoners were confident in young Kato's ability to find the target, they didn't trust him to finish the job. So whispered the Kami of Treachery. The force of Reckoners were there to assure his loyalty. Of course, Kato was no longer going with the original plan. So as they liked to do, the Reckoners went on to make an example of him. One got behind his sister, sword to her throat, while Tamishi rushed to the Tanuki Kami with his robotic suit, trying in vain to coax the spirit into the armor for protection. Though Kato could see, even now, in a dire situation, the Kami refused. Tamishi decided to play hero, offering himself and his research should they let the others go. They could never make sense of his notes without him, so it would be best to keep him and the others alive. While distracted, Aiko reared back and headbutted her assailant, revealing a tightly coiled katana that materialized just from a small portion of steel. Kato joined in the melee as brother and sister fought side by side. While the fighting continued, another group joined the fray. The Jukai monks had finally arrived to end the disturbance to their lands. These spirit warriors wielded both martial prowess and the channeled magic of the Kami. Sensing the Reckoners as a true threat, the monks attacked, giving time for the group to escape amongst the chaos. While running, they cross a river, right into the territory of a particularly nasty Kami. Lurching from the waters, it was the Kami of Forgotten Clearings, the one Kami the diplomats never wanted to see. It was highly aggressive and territorial, and it was coming right for them. It moved in erratic bursts, long limbs stretched out like it was searching by touch. Two orbs of unnatural green light glowed from its delicate stone face, but the carved smile it wore didn't match the anger radiating from its core. Frail as a skeleton, it had enough arms and legs to rival an insect, with heavy black cobwebs that fell over its crooked shape like a veil. Silk threads trailed from one of its bony fingers, fixed to a paper lantern that swayed in front of its chest like a pendulum. No amount of diplomacy would work here. The Kami lurched forward, ready to attack, when none other than the Tanuki Kami jumped forward in a flash of brilliant blue light. Kato staggered forward, watching as the small Kami stared down this hawking beast, whispering to it in an unknown language. The Tanuki looked to be commanding the Kami of Forgotten Clearings. And as the light faded, the Kami retreated back to the waters from whence it came. A Kami who commanded Kami. This was a power only Kaodai, the Great One, had. What was the secret of this little Tanuki? As the group escapes the Jukai Forest, they all believe something strange is happening between this Tanuki Kami and Kato. Only very special people can communicate with the Kami and this one seemed to be bound to Kato. With a simple look, their minds were one, and there, in this space between space, the Tanuki whispered its name, Himoto. Without warning, the Kami leaped from the ground and right into the small mechanical Tanuki Temishi had crafted. In a flash of light, the robot sprung to life, gears twirling, screens powering on, fueled by the energy of the Kami. No one could explain why, but this forbidden tech the Kami had shunned earlier was now its vessel, perched squarely on Kato's shoulder. It had nothing to offer the Kami, no food, no shelter, not even safety, but Himoto knew he was on a mission to restore the Emperor, a mission the Kami shared, a common goal only felt and never discussed. The small Kami changed and oriented its new body, controlling it far more than Tamishi had ever intended. Folding like paper, it shifted, and what was left was a sleek, metallic tanuki mask. Something compelled Kato to don the mask, and as he placed it over his face, a familiar voice whispered, Let go. He could feel his body leave reality, slipping through nothing. His soul was being pulled in a new, unknown direction. He could hear his sister shout to him, but it was fading. He couldn't fight the sensation. He didn't want to. Fate had brought these two together. They both sought the Emperor, and this Kami knew where to search. And it wasn't on Kamigawa. Kato took a step, and planes walked. Kato spent a year traveling the multiverse with Himoto, who he refers to as the Kami of the Spark. This Kami has turned Kato into a planeswalker, and together, 
They explored this power as well as other planes. They're seeking clues that will lead them to the missing Emperor, but even so, the pull to return to Kamigawa has always been strong. He frequently returns to his home just to reconnect with his sister and his new friend, Tamishi, filling them in on his adventures as well as any new leads they may have. Still, the multiverse had information he needed, and there was an enemy out there who was unaware of his new power. All thanks to the Kami of the Spark. Here we are entering Kamigawa Neon Dynasty with a new protagonist and planeswalker in Kato Shizuki. A young rogue trained as a samurai mentored by the Kitsune who befriends the moon folk now bound to a kami, in turn bound in a little tanuki robot. This may be, by far, one of the strangest origin stories of a planeswalker we have ever seen. There was no specific trauma that caused his spark to ignite. It was a gift bestowed upon him by Himoto, the Kami of the Spark, a spiritual being who can create a planeswalker. Now this may sound far-fetched or rather lore-breaking, but it's not unprecedented. Remember in Theros Beyond Death, the god of destiny, Clothes? She literally created the planeswalker Kallax out of thin air. Clothes is no planeswalker, she simply used her magic of fate to create a being who would be able to capture Elspeth Terrell, and since Elspeth is a planeswalker, Kallax manifested a spark just to fulfill his destiny. Still, this is clearly a spiritual being that was able to create something that was able to become a planeswalker. Sure, it's not a tanuki ghost trapped inside a mech suit that turns into a mask, but it's in the ballpark. Regardless, we have a new, very young planeswalker added to our roster, and this was his origin. Hopefully, this video answered the question of who Kato Suzuki is. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you support the channel by leaving a like, a comment, and becoming a subscriber. It all goes a long way in helping our community grow. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, see ya!